Hello. Hello. Okay, so the present the slides should be okay. Can you hear me okay? I can't hear you, James. You're on mute. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's workshop. Uh, we'll be starting in about three or four minutes' time. So if you just hang on, then we get started. Thank you. Testing, testing. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the room. Uh, we'll be starting in just a few minutes' time. Thank you. Hi, James. And just a quick welcome to everyone else that's just joined the room. Uh, we'll be starting the workshop in about one minute's time. Uh, hello, everyone. Good uh, afternoon. My name is Mark Tehan. I am a senior solutions engineer with Confluent. Um, and today's workshop is entitled Kafka Streaming in Minutes on Confluent Cloud. We'll be going for around about an hour or so. Um, uh, it, myself, I'll be presenting some of this. And my colleague in Sydney, James Gollan, who you'll hear from shortly, will be presenting some as well. Um, the the subject today is around uh, using CI/CD pipelines in order to create uh, complex event streaming systems. Uh, this will be the subject of the demo, um, and we'll also talk a little bit about why this is useful and why you'd want to build uh, systems like this uh, using the same technique. Um, 
So uh, as I say, I'm, uh, I'm a sales engineer with Confluent. I work mostly with customers and Apache Kafka users in Singapore, in Thailand, and in Philippines. Um, some, uh, mostly banks and financial services. And the example that we're going to walk through today is a case that has been used by a bank. So this is the, the demo that we're going to use. Um, this is an example of an, a complex event streaming system that streams data both synchronously and asynchronously between two different systems. So there's quite a lot of setup involved in this. Um, let me briefly step through what the different parts of this demo are, and then I'll explain to you how we're going to run it today um, and what kind of the format for the rest of the, the hour is. Um, if you have any questions and answers, please, or questions, please ask them in the chat box. Uh, another colleague, Dave Peterson, is also here um, from Confluent in Australia, and he will answer your questions. And at the end of the session, we will also have a few minutes for any wrap-up questions that you may have. All right, so the flow for this demo has two platforms, localhost, which is by MacBook, where I'm going to be creating some stuff, and Confluent Cloud. Um, we're going to it'll be using a data generator. Think of this as a microservice or any application that's going to push data, event streaming data into topics. Uh, it'll be pushing data in two directions, into a topic called page views on the Kafka cluster that's running on my desktop. It'll also be pushing data all, uh, to Kafka on Confluent Cloud to a topic called users, all right? Um, the, the messages that are go streaming into page views will be picked up by Confluent Replicator, and these will be replicated to uh, the Kafka cluster running on, uh, sorry, the Confluent Cloud cluster. So this is an example of doing asynchronous replication um, for for one top for a topic on one platform to another platform and quite a few of our customers that are setting up hybrid cloud systems use this sort of technique where data you know that must originate on prem perhaps it's from a core banking system or from oracle systems that run on prem etc you want to stream these using asynchronous replication to the yeah, cloud system this is an example of course of uh, synchronous replication because the data generator is simply producing directly into the user's topic all right, so once the data is on the Confluent Cloud system, this is where we're going to have a lot of the focus today. Um, we're going to, I'll be showing you the Confluent Cloud schema registry, uh, which lets you register schemas for the topics and manage those schemas and evolve them and this sort of thing. Uh, we show an example of stream processing. So there are two key stream processing engines for Apache Kafka. You may be more familiar with Kafka Streams, which is a Java library to let you build stream processing applications. It's been around for quite a few years. The more recent entrant here is uh, KSQL or KSQL DB, which is a, uh, an SQL based stream processing engine that lets you express stream processing uh, operations as select statements. So if you, know, if you know how to write a select statement, you can do stream processing as well. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the end state that, we're, that we'll be building on the system. So um, this is this, this series of steps that we're going to, that the, the script is going to go through. Now, um, this script is on my GitHub. We'll be showing you the, the link for that uh, at the end of the workshop. Um, by all means, download it, uh, unpack it, and run it. Um, uh, and you should have the, you'll be building the same environment that we're building here. So it'll go through a series of steps to create a new service account, uh, uh, to basically create a new environment on Confluent Cloud. I'll show you that in just a moment. Then we're going to create a Kafka cluster, um, uh, create a KSQL DB service to do stream processing. Uh, then we'll switch to the uh, my desktop in order to build a local uh, Kafka system on my MacBook. Uh, create some topics in the local cluster, fire up the data generator, which is going to start sending data in both directions to both my local cluster and to the remote cluster. Um, then we will start Kafka Connect, uh, which is a service to start replicating the messages from uh, my desktop to Confluent Cloud. Uh, we'll do some work on uh, access control lists. Um, and then finally, we'll do the streaming application, which is going to start joining and aggregating data that, that it's receiving from my desktop, MacBook, and it's been replicated in. So it's a sort of a full end-to-end -end stream processing example, okay? Um, so this is, th this is the, how it's scripted to run. So I'm going to, I'm going to kick off a start uh, script for, for, and it will use one of the three cloud providers. If I could ask one of the attendees, did you please in the chat box, just put in GCP or Azure or AWS, 
um, and when it, whichever one pops up first. So I'm just going to use that to build out this demo. Because Confluent Cloud, of course, is simply a layer that sits above all of the three major cloud providers. So you can choose to build clusters on any of these three. And so it really gives you the full multi-cloud flexibility of running uh, fully managed Kafka on cloud. OK. Um, and uh, just before we jump over and have a look at that, I just want to have uh, just kind of come back to why this would be useful. So uh, one of uh, several of the largest banks in Thailand are my customers. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, running a complex uh, mobile banking application, uh, which is fully event based. So all of the data flows through their Kafka system. Um, and it's a hyper competitive business. If you're a bank in Thailand, you, there's really a race to have the best features in your mobile banking application because it influences a lot of customer activity. So they took the same script that we're looking at today, uh, around about March or April or so, in order to build out a benchmark script. So once a month, they allocate a day um, where they run a full-blown benchmark uh, on the pre-release of the of the application before it goes out to the before they release it onto their system. Um, they basically uh, use this script in order to create an environment, create a cluster. They create about 180 topics. Then they start up a number of data generators to simulate user activity. And then they fire up their, all of the various microservices that connect to this to process the data. Then they scale everything up to 32 instances. So all of the microservices, which are on Spring Boot, they'll scale up to full size. And they start running the benchmark. And it runs for eight hours. During the eight hours, they extract all of the JMX metrics into Prometheus and Grafana and to so various other stuff into Elastic. After eight hours, they shut everything down and scale it back down to zero again. And that really is the difference between running on a fully managed system and running on a self-managed system. They don't need to keep a Kafka, a Kafka system running on VMs or on Docker on-prem to do this. They don't even need to keep a Kafka system running on EC2 nodes to keep this running. They simply fire up a cluster to do the benchmark. Everything runs within about 12 hours or so. Um, including the setup and teardown, and uh, they only pay for usage for that 12 hours. So for the rest of the month, um, there's no uh, hosting or usage costs for something like this. So it's, it's, it keeps this type of activity in mind as I go through this. Um, this shows you the sorts of things that you can do. Um, can I just confirm with my colleague, James? You can, you can see my slides sharing OK. Is that correct? Hopefully. All right. So, can, okay. I can see the slide. No, Thank you no, very much. No, no issues. Um, have we, do we have any nominees for a cloud stack? Are you able to see the chat box? If not, I'll simply pick one. It doesn't matter. OK. All right, so uh, just before we dive into this and before I kick off the script, so this is our starting point. I'm logging, I've logged into Confluent Cloud. We're looking at environments. I have three here. We have James Test. Uh, James, you'll be talking to shortly. Uh, development and something like SIT October 2020 Sprint. You create environments in the same way that you manage environments for self-managed system test dev prod. And within each environment, you create as many clusters as you need. So typically for development systems, we you would see one environment per developer. And within sort of shared environments like this, you would have more a, a more production-like environment. So when we run the script, we will see a new environment being created here um, with the Kafka cluster, the topics, and all of the streaming activity that's, that's going to happen. So, this, uh, so let's kick off, uh, run me, let's, let's go with uh, AWS. Um, so this is the shell script that sits above uh, the, the, how, how this demo is going to run. So it starts off by logging into my Confluent Cloud system using the Confluent Cloud CLI. It lists the environments that we just saw. This is the Confluent Cloud CLI, and these are the things that it lets you do, just like the various other, um, the, the major cloud providers that provide you with desktop CLIs to interact with your cluster, Confluent provide you with the same. So this CLI lets you interact with your environments, with your Kafka clusters, with your schema registry, uh, with your connectors to set up streaming ETL in and out, and with KSQL to do stream processing, plus a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, uh, as you would find for the, the major CLIs. Um, so uh, it's paused now. As you see, uh, we're going to do this on AWS. We're going to kick it off on AP Southeast One, which is Singapore, which is where I'm located. So I want to have the, the best response time. So we kick that off. And I'm simply going to, to let this run. Now, it's going to take 
a while to get up and running. It takes 15 to 18 minutes to build the full stack that I showed you. Um, so I'm going to let this kick off and to run in the background. Uh, this screen will still be sharing, so you can you can jump back in and observe it now and again if you want to. Um, and then when James has uh, completed, then I'll resume and show you exactly what it's built. And we'll kind of take a tour uh, and do the last one or two steps before we finish. So happy to hand over to James to take you through the next part. James. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so look, I've just shared my screen. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is uh, whiteboarding through um, uh, through uh, some basics around Kafka, because like uh, what we're doing right now is quite complex. But I, I realize that some people in the workshop, you know, they may have heard of Kafka, they may have even used Kafka. But um, what I want to run through is kind of like uh, what's on my screen now. Just a little note about the platform. actually double click on um, an individual tile that will maximize it, so that you'll have a better view of what I'm drawing out. And so. Um, there are kind of four points that I'm going to walk through. Um, the first one is, what's the big idea behind Kafka? Like, what, what has Kafka done which has made it become so popular in so many use cases? Um, the next point will be, uh, how are people using Kafka today? So some of the classic kind of use cases for Kafka that we see um, our clients uh, implementing. Um, what's involved in managing a Kafka cluster? Now, that's going to be extremely high level. I just want to sort of like I point out essentially some of the complexity. Um, and then how does Kafka as a service or Confluent Cloud, how does that actually help address some of that, those difficulties? So I'm going to start off um, with this kind of like, what's the big idea? And really, the big idea comes from this notion um, of, you've probably heard it a few times, um, events. Right? So you've heard it a few times during this uh, conference, uh, people are talking about events and events streaming. Um, and that's the notion that if I have a business, um, it's made up of a series of things that happen that contain business value. And so what I'm drawing out here is a simple manufacturing example when um, uh, we receive a delivery um, and that goes into a factory and then that, um, that product starts getting processed within the factory. And each time there's a, a change to the state of that, um, that uh, item, um, that can be considered an event. Um, so we've got the delivery drop-off event and we've got a whole series of events during the transformation. The product gets picked up by the truck. That's an event. The truck drives and drops off the product. That's an event. But even the movement of the truck across its delivery route, these are all events. And the notion that a business can be defined by capturing these events is very important and core to the idea behind Kafka and event streaming. Um, obviously, this is a very real-world use case using a, a variety of kind of like um, event capture methods. Um, but we also can uh, look at events as coming from things like databases. Okay, so any change to the state of a database can be captured as an event. Okay, so once we accept that kind of like events are very important and they sort of like are very important in defining um, a business, um, we need a method for actually working with events. And this is where Kafka uh, really came in fundamental uh, abstraction. It's the core abstraction in Kafka. Um, and it's put very simply, um, it is treating, uh, it is storing those events as an event log, all right? Uh, like any other computer, computer log, events are pushed into this log. Um, and this is an unbounded log, so new events are just pushed on to the end of the log. And that basically, is the core abstraction within Kafka um, that gives it all of its power. Now, around that, Kafka has gone in and added a number of APIs. And so this is where we get relevant to uh, the, the conference. Um, so the, the, the fundamental APIs in Kafka are the producer API, which allows you to create events and push them into Kafka, and the consumer API which, as you probably could guess, allows you to pull events out of Kafka. Um, now, on top of these um, APIs are a couple of other APIs. So um, we they're built on top of the producer APIs, but they offer a higher level of abstraction. So those APIs are the connect API, which allows you to connect various systems into Kafka, um, and then also the streams API, 
which allows you to listen to events within Kafka and apply transformations to them. And so, uh, to be to be uh, strictly correct, we should uh, we should have those uh, APIs. Um, they they work with the producer and consumer APIs. Um, now, essentially, uh, that is the core abstraction in Kafka. It's a, a set of APIs wrapped around a commit log that allows you to work with events. Um, Kafka also, um, there's uh, people who have used Kafka may think of it in a particular way uh, because quite often it's used for one reason, and that's really around that pub sub use case, right? So that's the idea that because Kafka is really good at dealing with events at scale, both ingestion um, and, and pulling them out of Kafka, um, the um, many use cases uh, up until now have been just purely pub sub, uh, which is fine because it's a very good system for doing that. Uh, I think uh, Tencent uh, use uh, more than 10 trillion events per day flowing through Kafka. That's 112 million events per second. So it works at these incredible scales. Um, but there's a couple of other aspects which are often overlooked about Kafka. Uh, one is storage. The idea that you store the events in Kafka um, and the reason that's important is because once you do that, uh, Kafka can become a source of truth to the business. Okay. We'll talk about this in the use cases. Um, and then the final thing is this notion of stream processing. So it's not just about getting events into and out of a, an event log. Uh, it's also the ability to modify events uh, within um, or process events within that event log to create new, more powerful events. Okay. So that's the, that's the core of Kafka. Just moving out across to uh, use cases. Okay, so we see, um, we see that there's uh, like a huge number of use cases, but like I picked out um, four very common use cases. And the first is, um, is sort of like a database or mainframe offload, right? So a lot of businesses have a legacy monolith app and that's, that's relying on a mainframe or a database. Um, and the problem there is that um, lots of applications want access to that data, um, and that leads to issues uh, where the database either doesn't scale well enough to, to meet these demands. Um, sometimes it's a cost issue where the cost of actually querying the mainframe is very expensive. So the first use case that we're going to look at is just this concept of database offload. And so um, this tube represents... Kafka. So this is Kafka. Um, and what we do is we listen to the database um, using a mechanism, uh, typically uh, using a connector, typically using change data capture, which essentially just is a, a very efficient way of listening for changes to the database. And when that uh, when those changes come through, we capture those changes uh, in, in the form of an event, right? So all of these changes that are happening in the database are getting stored as events in Kafka. Um, and what that allows us to do is rather than building these services against the main database, we can start to build them against the event store. And um, the reason we can do this is first of all, because of those APIs, which allow us to query events, but also because of this kind of, this notion that I mentioned before of storage. So these events can actually live in here basically for an infinite period. Um, and what that means is we still have the system of record as being the main database, but we then can use Kafka as a source of truth. Right. So that's the first use case, and it's a very common one for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, it allows people to innovate in a cost-effective way against uh, data that they already own. So moving along, um, the, the second uh, use case uh, that I'm going that, that is quite common this notion of customer 360. So um, many organizations are um, collecting information about their customers uh, in a number of different systems and quite often they're siloed. So it, it may be that main database is capturing some uh, facets of the customer, but we've also got information in a CRM um, and possibly uh, quick stream data from them interacting with mobile apps and websites. Um, and it, it's quite hard to get all this information um, in one place. So again, we look at Kafka as a central store and we connect these upstream uh, data silos and we push our data 
into Kafka. Okay, so now we've got all the all the data in Kafka, but it's still siloed in the sense that it's uh, in different event streams or topics. Um, and this is where stream processing comes in. So stream processing um, is is very simple in concept. It's this idea that you can listen to uh, streams of events, and you can ingest them. You can manipulate them in some way, apply a transformation, and then push them out into a new event stream. And so in this case, um, in, in this case, the, the event stream here might be our customer 360, right? And so what we've done in our stream processing uh, is to, is to uh, join multiple, uh, multiple topics um, on a customer ID or some other unique identifier. Uh, so what we have here is an enriched uh, view of the customer stored in a single topic, right? So customer 360 and stream processing. Now this is typically uh, these days, we're looking at customers who are doing KSQL DB. So KSQL DB, uh, Mark is gonna be showing you a little bit of that uh, soon, uh, but KSQL DB is essentially a stream processing application that runs um, alongside Kafka and as part of Confluent Cloud. Okay, so actually taking, uh, I might just uh, take this entire uh, diagram, I might just duplicate that because it's, it's, it's the fundamentals for the next use case. So the next use case is around, um, is around a microservice architecture. So an event-driven microservice architecture. So um, I know a lot of people at this conference will be doing a lot with microservices and a lot with APIs, and uh, we're all, all for APIs, but we do have other ways of, uh, I suppose, implementing microservice architectures. So uh, a typical microservice architecture might look like this, where you've got an individual, micro, an individual microservice here, and we can duplicate that a number of times. So we've got three microservices now. And these microservices, these microservices, if I can deselect that, uh, these microservices will be communicating to each other uh, often via uh, RESTful APIs. Um, and so they're all sort of like aware of each other and they're, they're, they're querying the right microservice to get the information. Um, but if we actually rethink this um, to use an event streaming kind of like paradigm, uh, what we can do is rather than these microservices actually querying other microservices or other APIs to, to find, um, yeah, to, to populate or to, to complete a task, um, a microservice is, is uh, concerned with a particular domain of events. So the microservice will listen to a particular topic and it, will, it can write to another topic. And so this microservice now just needs to listen to a topic that's important. And the same for the other ones. So we've we break down this inter-microservice communication, and we start with this idea of an event-based uh, bus, essentially, to move messages between systems. And this uh, has the effect of decoupling, but it also has the effect that now these microservices can actually capture uh, things like this enriched stream, the customer 360. Um, and in that case, uh, they start becoming uh, much more efficient because they've got more of a view of the customer and uh, the, the, notion, the notion of uh, then streaming is that this gets updated uh, essentially all the time. Okay, so that's a third use case, probably quite relevant to um, the, the kinds of concept uh, during this, uh, this conference. Uh, look, the final use case that I wanted to mention, so the fourth one, um, this is a classic use case in banking, uh, uh, fraud detection. And fraud detection in real time and that's actually important because all of the use cases I've mentioned, they bring a real time uh, dynamic to the, to the whole, uh, to the implementation. Um, so fraud detection currently happens in batch processes overnight. Uh, and so maybe we've got uh, a mainframe which is capturing transactions um, and that's going off to a data warehouse uh, and then it's being processed overnight. And we find out that yesterday we processed a fraudulent transaction. So when we bring kind of like Kafka and event streaming into this into this space, uh, again we have Kafka. We're capturing the data uh, from this transaction database or transactional system, uh, just like just like we were before, and that's creating a series of events uh, inside Kafka. And we're also reusing that that notion of uh, event streaming. So using KSQL DB uh, to to listen 
to that stream and to process that stream and then to write to another stream. But um, the interesting thing about this use case uh, is that it starts to bring into play uh, this notion of time windowing. Um, and so one of the things that is actually quite unique when you start working with uh, is this notion that you can, you can break that data into windows of time. So these are referred to as window queries. So fraud detection, one of the most common sort of like, you know, but it's overly simplified, but like a common pattern is uh, to look for a number of uh, events that happen within a time window, which would make us suspicious. So as an example, if I see a credit card used three times within maybe one minute, um, that may be enough to trigger an alert or even to cancel a transaction before it happens. Um, so in this case, using KSQL DB, I can use basically a very simple SQL-like syntax. This is pseudocode, by the way. So it might be select credit card number um, where, where account of transactions um, is uh, greater than three uh, or greater than or equal to three uh, within a tumbling window or a window of five minutes. So as new data comes into this stream, um, this query will be constantly run. And when it actually gets a match, it can output to a new uh, a new uh, topic, uh, and we can have downstream systems listening for those topics. So we might have kind of a notification microservice that is constantly listening for triggers um, and then processing those triggers by sending out alerts across the channel that's configured. Uh, but as I said before, we can also have this integrated, because it's real time, this can actually be triggered when somebody swipes their credit card and the, can, and the transaction can, never, can be declined uh, without the transaction ever going through. And so you can see the kind of like a, the real time use cases here. Okay, so we've covered kind of like the core idea of event streaming some use cases. So if that's the case, like if, if event streaming is so useful, uh, why aren't more people doing it? Well, something that we, we do here is that Kafka can be hard to manage in production. Um, and it's true, it's a distributed system, it's built for scale, but there's complexities to it. Um, and so a Kafka cluster at its very simplest will be made up of um, these multiple kind of like applications. So we've got Zookeeper here, which is kind of like a distributed key value store. Um, and then we've got the Kafka brokers themselves uh, that form part of a cluster. Now, uh, these can be expanded and scaled. That's not the point of this conversation, but the point is, all of these things need to talk to each other. Um, they all need to be deployed on their own uh, virtual machines, um, ideally. Uh, and so Zookeeper needs to talk to each other. And all of these communications need to be secured. So they need to be over TLS and they may be using sort of like some kind of Kerberos for authentication. Um, and that's just Kafka. So Kafka sits in a cluster like that and it can be scaled with NAD brokers and it handles all of that stuff. But then we've got our Connect cluster, which sits alongside a Kafka cluster. And that's made up of individual workers. And we've got KSQL DB, uh, which again is made up with this idea of um, parallels, workers in parallel, so we can scale by adding more boxes here. Um, but what you start to see is that these have to start talking to the Kafka cluster. And so we've got kind of like SSL and encryption, et cetera, that has to happen here. And um, essentially, there are complexities to running Kafka. There's also lots of metrics to, to, uh, to monitor. Now, some of our biggest clients, they run this stuff because they've got a team that's big enough to actually manage it and it makes sense for them because they've got unique requirements. Um, but when we actually add in CI, CD workflows, um, then we've got to have even think about more complexities. So how do we spin up a test cluster? So we probably need some kind of Terraform scripts to, to, to procure the hardware. And then we need some kind of um, Ansible or Kubernetes uh, operators, so Ansible, Kubernetes. Um, so there's things that you have to build and you have to manage your kind of like your cloud architecture, your, your cloud accounts. Uh, so there's all the stuff that you actually have to do in order to uh, move to a, a true CI CD process. Um, and that's where we sort of like uh, move along and I, I start wrapping up uh, where we talk about Confluent Cloud. And so Confluent Cloud is essentially you know, all of these components we see here, plus a few more, um, so I haven't talked about schema registry or anything like that, but they're all sitting in um, a managed service, so software as a service. 
And the value proposition of software as a service is you get to do your business logic. You get to build out your business applications, but you never have to worry about the fact that you've got Zookeeper and you've got brokers and you've got connect workers. All of these things, the value proposition is that uh, you, you subscribe to this service uh, so that you never have to worry about these things. You worry about more operational kind of business level metrics. Um, now, uh, one of the one of the challenges sometimes of a software as a service uh, it, um, is people think, okay, well that's that's simple and it doesn't really scale to the use cases, um, you know. And so CI/CD, for example. Uh, but what we're showing here, and why I'm about to throw back the mark, is because. You can use using using the Confluence CLI. You can easily build this into your deployment script, your CI/CD processes, so that you're automatically creating and tearing down uh, infrastructure which matches uh, your production infrastructure. Um, so that was a <laughs> that was a bit of a whirlwind. Um, I probably over time, but um, I think I'll just throw it back to uh, Mark to see if uh, if we've completed. Thank you very much, James. Uh, welcome back to me. So it's still running. Uh, we're so it's going through the process and CLs and things like that. So we let that we let that uh, continue on. It should be another few minutes or so. And while that's running, I'm just going to jump into Confluent Cloud and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we just saw. So when we looked at this earlier, there was there there were three environments. Let me do a reload on this. I have to log in again. Uh, and we should see that we have a fourth environment for for the system that we're building now. It's all on my home Wi-Fi, so it's a little bit slow. Um, and the uh, as we can see, and the the script behind is continuing, and we have a benchmark environment here, which contains one cluster, as you can see here. So the the CI/CD script that we're running uh, has been using the C Cloud uh, CLI in order to, to set up and configure everything. As you can see, it's, this is AWS in AP Southeast One. This is a single zone cluster, so it's running in one AZ. Uh, it's a, a, a basic type of cluster. We offer three types of clusters. Um, and we can see, so far, it's got five partitions. It's producing at about two kilobytes per second. It is a demo consuming at about 1.7 kilobytes per second, 1.8 megabytes of storage. We got one KSQL application running and zero connectors. So the build is continuing. If I just jump back here, you can see that it's it's on step eight of eight for cloud about to create stream processing applications. Um, I want to sort of drill in on on what James means when he says that this stuff is simpler. So if I wanted to add a cluster here, so this is the same as my customers up in Thailand that that build out their their demo uh, clusters. You don't have to do it via CI/CD. You can do it via the UI, um, and you have really have full transparency on what you're building and what it's going to cost you. So supposing I want to build on a system on Azure. Let's build it in. Uh, what do we have? Uh, let's build it in Singapore as well. Say, um, and then I can see straight away what what, what it's going to cost me to run this cluster. It's it, it's a scale to zero cluster, zero dollars per hour, and then fourteen cents for every gigabyte that I read and that that, that I write to this cluster. Um, for, this is basically for a basic cluster. If I say I want a standard cluster. I wanted multi-zone across three AZs, and you can see my base cost has gone up to a dollar eighty per hour, right? So the idea is you can play around here with different platforms. If we go to Google and we switch over to uh, say Mumbai, um, you can see the cost as well for for different cloud providers for building different types of systems. And the idea is you choose the type of system that's appropriate for what you want to build. Is this test or dev? Um, is this a scale to zero cluster that should cost you nothing overnight? Or is this a full-blown production system that should be on three AZs that should have VPC peering um, or private link or any of these sorts of conditions that you would have for a production cluster? OK, so I'm going to jump back over and have a look at a couple of things. The first is I told you this demo is building two systems. One is an on-prem part, and the other is the cloud part. So the on-prem part here means that I'm building a uh, a cluster using Confluent Platform on my MacBook. Um, it's a, and as you can see here, this is this is Control Center. It's localhost 9021. Um, this is Control Center. Uh, it's it's a it's one of several different types of management GUIs for uh, for Kafka systems. 
Um, and we can see we have a cluster for cloud and a cluster for local. If I drill into the cluster for local, this is a system running on my laptop that has been set up by the script that's running just behind. I have nine topics. I'm running a single broker. It's dev, 141 partitions. Um, I have one connect cluster running. If I look at my topics, I can see a page views topic in here. All right, and this is this is where the data is coming from. There's only one producer running on the system, so I'm generating some data, uh, and uh, it's got six partitions, and I can see the offsets for the uh, for each of the partitions here. So roughly 1,500 messages per partition uh, for the system. Uh, I can also take a quick look at the messages and see what's being generated and being replicated up to Confluent Cloud. So these are the messages streaming in real time. You can see this is moving. Um, and basically, it has some dummy data for view time, user ID, page ID, stuff like that. Okay. Now, this system, of course, is running a replicator because I'm replicating the data from my on-prem system. If you're running Kafka on VMs or on Docker or on Kubernetes, you can use this tool in order to asynchronously replicate topics. So in this case, my source topic is page views and consumer timestamps, which is a mandatory topic to do with consumer offsets. Um, and this is replicating up to my Confluent Cloud system. And it's doing around about 18 messages per second. Um, this is because it's, I'm only generating about 18 per second. We, uh, we set one of these up for a customer in Manila last week. And their, start, their ticking over speed is about 60 megabytes per second. And at month end, and when they scale up, it goes up to about 230, 240 megabytes per second. So they run multiple replicator VMs in order to push that volume of data through. So that's kind of what's happening on-prem. So let's let's jump back to cloud and have a look into this cluster and see what, what we're receiving. Okay, so this is the cluster overview. We saw this already. Um, so this this looks a little bit like control center, the one I just showed you. But there, are, there there's one major glaring difference. There are no brokers, right? Cluster overview, data flow topic. If I jump back to control center, we had we had a tab for brokers. We were able to see our brokers here. Um, and we're able to see how much storage they have, the controller ID, if Zookeeper's connected, all that sort of stuff. For a fully managed system, you don't, you don't need to know that because the system is fully managed. So it's the responsibility of Confluent as your service provider for this under SLA to ensure that your Zookeepers are always connected to your brokers, that you don't have under-replicated partitions, and that all of your, you have the correct number of replicas, um, and that your brokers are distributed correctly over the number of availability zones that you specified. So we don't have a brokers tab. You don't need to to uh, uh, manage brokers anymore. And I think this this alone takes a, takes away a large part of the complexity of running an Apache Kafka system. Thinking about you know all the stuff that you need to manage for for Kafka brokers. So as you can see, the system is. Uh, um, it's the throughput on the system is uh, uh, the data is flowing through here. It's a little bit lumpy. It's coming from over my Wi-Fi. Um, if I click on data flow, then I will be able to see a bit more information about the source producers, the topics, um, the and then uh, where the data, the, the consumers for those topics, and some level of depiction of, of of the volume of data that's coming through each of these pipelines. These are each of these are streaming pipelines of data. Um, on the topics view, I expect to see the topics that that are both um, being produced to directly from my on-prem, which of course is, is, uh, is connecting directly to Confluent Cloud in order to produce, because I want to have a fully synchronous RPO0, RTO0 pipeline uh, from, from my desktop to, to cloud. Um, and we also have the replicated data that's coming through uh, the asynchronously replicated data. And you'll see there's a whole bunch of other um, topics here. And this is because the, this, the, in the background, the stream processing application has run. I'm not going to go through all of this. Basically, the output from, from the script that ran, uh, and as you can see here, it has concluded, right? So it said, done, connect to Confluent Cloud UI at this. Um, to stop this demo and to destroy, you, you delete all this. So the, the demo has concluded. And the final part of this was to run KSQL statements in order to create stream processing pipelines. In order to do statements, something like this, create stream, page views female like 89 as select asterisk from page views female, or a region ID like, a, like that string, or region ID like this string. So this is a filter pipeline for stream processing. Um, and as you can see, it looks a bit like SQL, right? You cannot create a stream in a database. Databases have tables and views and various other objects. They don't have objects like streams. And this is a streaming process specific 
sort of um, object. So let, I'm going to jump back into the UI because it's easier to understand how stream processing applications run by looking at the KSQL DB um, UI. So let's have a look at that. We can see there's one application running here. Uh, it's up. So this is this is a um, even though we're running create stream commands and we shortly run a create table command. This is not creating objects in a data in the same sense as creating objects in a database. What we're doing is deploying an application. If I click on this, this is a basically a runtime platform for an application that's doing stream processing operations on data that's coming in from various sources, right? So those sorts of operations are things like filters. I want to direct data to true, false, to yes, no, to commercial enterprise, etc. I want to do joins. So supposing I want to join data that's coming from an Oracle database with data that's coming from a microservice to, to say, test limits or to do audit checks or something like that, then I would do a, a stream joining op um, operation. And perhaps I want to do aggregation. I want to count and sum um, the number of credit card transactions that are streaming in every 30 seconds in exactly the way that James was, was describing. And several of our banking customers do this for real-time fraud detection. And we would consider that to be a, um, a streaming aggregation to count, it, to count them. So um, a, a stream, a case SQL DB uh, application is a, it, it's a live application. Think of this as your deployed Spring Boot application, but you haven't had to um, to to do it sort of the Spring Boot way. So there's no Java code and compilation needed here. And it's simpler even than Kafka Streams because uh, basically KSQL DB will auto-compile the SQL-like statements into stream processing operations and deploy them like this. Now, I am simplifying quite a lot. There's a lot happening in the background here. But you can see we basically have a flow for an application here where, where it's depicting a left to right flow for, for messages going through to objects, streaming objects. We can see what the various streams are here. Um, the number of partitions, the replication factor for these, and the different data formats that are available. Uh, unlike a database where you store data the, the way the database tells you, in a Kafka system, you can store the messages in, in a number of different uh, message formats, such as Avro and JSON, et cetera. We don't have any, uh, we have one table. We're about to create another one. And running queries are really, these are, each of these is essentially like a microservice. Right? It's a single discrete stream processing application that's receiving data from a, it's consuming data from a topic, doing something to it, and it's producing the data into another topic. So this is, this is equivalent to deploying, say, a, some sort of a, a microservice that, that achieves this sort of functionality. I won't, I'm not going to drill down too much, but we can, we can see quickly there's, there's obviously a join in here. So I'm joining two topics together. Um, and there's also a where clause. So I'm doing some sort of a filter because I have a where clause. All right. Um, and to demonstrate, I, I, and you can see here, this one is processing about six messages per second. This one is processing about 0 0.96 messages per second because it's a different source receiving data at a different pace. All right, I'm going to show you how we create these. So at, at the end, I didn't create the final object. This was create table page views regions. So let's just cut and paste this over into the editor in KSQL DB. All right, so a quick look at the statement. We're doing a create table page view regions as select gender region ID count of asterisks as num users from a topic called page views female. Uh, we're going to do a window tumbling size 30 seconds, and then we're going to do a group by, and we're going to do a having count greater than one. So it's actually, there's a, there's a bunch of things happening in here. Okay, uh, we're, we're going to create a table called page views, page views regions. This is this will um, put it into a new topic called page views regions because we're creating a table. This will be a thing called a compacted topic, right? This, what we're trying to do here is create state on the Kafka system. We want to know, based on the, the various conditions that follow, I want to be able to query a top, uh, consume from a topic called page views regions um, uh, to find the messages that, that meet certain criteria. So it's very common for these types of applications to have a microservice consuming the messages at the end. 
all right? Um, so you, you may have a Spring Boot application that hangs off the end of this to consume every message that can be produced in here. Um, we're selecting from, it's from a, uh, a stream or a table called Page Views Female, which probably has a topic of the same name. A window tumbling size 30 seconds. So this is the difference with a database, right? This is streaming data. The data is moving through all the time. And this statement deals with uh, message by message. It's not doing any micro batching. Uh, it's not it's not waiting and doing stuff at intervals. Every message that comes through is processed, and then the, the, we, we are specifying that we want to um, we, we want to have a window of data that slides that tumbles forward every thirty seconds. There are three different types of of ways of moving a window within KSQL DB. Um, we're going to group by the gender and the region ID to get the count, and we, we we're only interested in cases where we have a count greater than one. Right, where we have a gender and a region greater than one within a 30 second window. So there's a fair bit happening here. Um, the query properties, uh, if you're familiar with Kafka, you know that you have to spec specify whether we want this earliest or latest and click run query. So we're now deploying a new uh, operation in our stream processing pipeline. All right, so as you can see, it's, it's telling us that the output is saying uh, basically success. It doesn't really tell you success but it doesn't give us an error, so we indicate that to be success. Oh, state of success, there you go. Um, and it's created a query ID, and basically it says, uh, now our, our, our application is up and running. If I jump over to tables, we now have two tables. We had one before, all right? So page views regions is now deployed, um, and you can see the topic that it's using, six partitions, replication factor three. And if I jump over to the running queries, uh, we can see uh, it was called page views female, right? Er, let me jump back here. Uh, page views regions. Let's filter that. Oh, uh, uh, the filter uh, is going to show me everything with page views. Okay, there's page views regions. That's the one we've just deployed, and it's processing about 2.53 messages per second. If I jump back to my data flow, where I had my uh, original sort of topic view of what's happening. Now we can see that this has been added. I, have an, I, I now have a new uh, uh, application up and running, um, and it's, it's consuming data. And if I want to come in and drill down, and my, my Mac is, is struggling a little bit with the amount that I'm running, but basically I, I would be able to, if I waited long enough, I'd be able to see the messages flowing through. All right, we're starting to see some messages come through here. Okay, so that's um, that. That was a quick tour of, of of some of the key sort of parts of running Kafka on a managed platform. There's one other thing that I just wanted to touch on. Um, the reason that this took about uh, 20 minutes to to stand up and get running is mostly because of streaming ETL, Kafka Connect. So setting up a mana a pipeline from one Kafka cluster, or sorry, from one source system to another source to another system, um, and these are called connectors. I set up a replicator connector uh, that streamed from one topic to another to from one cluster to another cluster, and I also set up the data gen connector, which is probably here somewhere, which is basically a, a data generator that you can use just to generate content. Um, this is also I'd say one of the areas that I would consider on along the more uh, the more difficult part of of uh, managing Apache Kafka system. So it's a bit more complex. Apache Kafka as an API uh, is is fairly involved because it runs for everything from the simple demo that I showed you to investment banks that are singing syncing you know hundreds of thousands of messages per second into BigQuery from their on-prem MQ systems and stuff like that. So you can set up very complex flows that require transformations, that require a lot of parallelism, that require encoding and decoding, uh, various function calls and things like that, which is what makes Connect complex. Um, it's a, it's uh, given the choice of being able to deploy managed connectors from Confluent Cloud where you can pick either a source or a sync so as your event hub source or Elasticsearch service sync, and you simply specify the topic. If I clicked on the service sync like this, I could send the data from, say, the page views female topic that I just showed here. I would configure the data, uh, the, connect the connectivity details for my Elasticsearch system, and it will start streaming the messages into an Elasticsearch index. And then you can query in Kibana or whatever and see the messages flowing through. And this is a fully managed pipeline. So you don't have to worry about it starting or stopping or tasks or scaling. Uh, this is all provided as part of the SLA. There's a few other things here. We're not really going to go into them um, on today's talk. 
but I hope it's it's uh, given you a, a reasonable idea of sort of the possibility of both running a um, a fully managed system um, and then taking that really a step beyond where you're able to build a uh, a fully automated uh, script in order to deploy and tear down these systems. And a quick reminder of yeah, this: my customer, my my customer in Thailand has use this very effectively to build monthly benchmark systems that they stand up, they really hammer with large volumes of data for about eight hours, tear it down, extract all the metrics, and then basically um, there's no running cost for the system for the, for the remainder of the month. That's a, a practical application for what I've just shown you. Hope it's been useful. Okay, so that, that concludes uh, the tour of the demo. Um, this is on my GitHub. We'll be sharing the URL with you a little bit later on. Uh, uh, and now we're going to sort of wrap up a little bit and take any questions that you may have. So I'll hand you back to James. Right. Thanks, Mark. That was a, yeah, like a really great example of how you go about integrating uh, a CICD pipeline uh, and uh, Kafka locally and Confluent Cloud. Um, so I'm just going to. Uh, Share my uh, share that slideshow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, Dave is asking in the uh, chat if there are any questions on what you've seen today. Um, let's see any any questions at the moment. So. Yeah, let us know. Um, otherwise, um, just uh, talking through kind of uh, what you saw today. Uh, so I've just shared the the link to um, to the the GitHub repository uh, that allows you to build out um, the system that Mark has just shown you. You will need a Confluent Cloud account, um, so that that needs to be set up first. But as part of kind of um, as part of the workshop, uh, we're we're giving away kind of like I suppose uh, you can set up a cloud account uh, and get two hundred dollars free credit per month for the first three months. So as long as you keep under two hundred dollars of spend, there's no there's no charges. But on top of that, there's an additional four hundred dollars of credit on that cloud account um, using the promo code of about four hundred. So uh, to to start setting up, go to confluent.io/confluentcloud and uh, it will guide you through the process of setting up your first cloud account. If, you've, uh, if there are any other questions kind of like that come up uh, after this workshop, uh, we, we do have a booth. Uh, so if you, uh, in your UI, uh, on the Partners Village, uh, you'll find Confluent have a booth with people who are ready to engage in conversations. Um, but if, it, if the questions come to you, after this conference is over, and it's soon to be over, uh, feel free. I've got my email address uh, on the slide. Uh, so that's jgollum at confluent.io. So uh, feel free to send me an email directly, and I'm more than happy to follow up with any questions that have been raised through this workshop. So I don't see any, any questions. I might just. Uh, Stop sharing that that screen. And thank you, everybody. Oh, um, so we do have a question. Um, can all Confluent features also be deployed on premises server? Yeah. So uh, we do have two flavors, I guess, of Confluent. There's Confluent Cloud, which is the fully managed service that we're talking about today. There's also Confluent Platform. And Confluent Platform is designed to be uh, deployed on-premise. And so that's self-managed, uh, but we do offer tools to help you self-manage that. So for example, um, Ansible playbooks or um, or Kubernetes uh, operators, uh, a Kubernetes operator to actually uh, help you deploy and maintain those, um, yeah, uh, those, those on-premise offerings. Uh, there's, there's, 
mostly feature uh, mostly features sort of like a parity between the two, but there are some features that are available um, on Confluent Platform that are being rolled out to Confluent Cloud uh, very soon. So there's um, some some minor differences between the two, uh, but you know as as we move on, we're, we're moving towards sort of feature parity around those things. So it's constantly evolving. Um, and a very common deployment pattern, as Mark mentioned, is that um, some of your, you, you may have Kafka cluster running on premise, and then that's actually sharing some or all of the topics to a cloud-based deployment. Uh, and so that can be done for security reasons. It can be done for just, um, you know, for, for cost reasons, uh, there are various reasons why you might want to actually run that kind of like a, as, as two clusters uh, with Replicator, um, as you saw in the example. Come on. Okay. So look, I mean, it, it looks like uh, all of the uh, questions for the session. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. We certainly have enjoyed being part of it. Um, and yeah, I might see you in the in the wrap up for for the conference. Thank you. <laughs>